today is the year anniversary. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's the year anniversary of our No Excuses series. And, um, and don't tell them I said this, but those who went away for spring break, they broke our No Excuses clause. I'm, I'm just kidding. If they, if they want to get away a little bit, that's fine. Uh, but I did wonder this morning how many were actually not going to come because they, they believed the weatherman's predictions of all the snow and stuff that we're supposed to get, and so they didn't come this morning, and so technically they broke the, the no excuses thing too. But uh, we have several, you'll hear more about this later on from Robbie, but um, we have several, uh, just most of the families, I mean the good news is that most of the families actually have kept that, um, that you have been here the majority of the time over the last year that you know you haven't used excuses to stay away. I mean, obviously we're going to miss some, and, and that's that's okay. We don't, but but you know the the whole idea of the no excuses was just simply to say we are not going to let anything stand between us and our worship of our God. And so congratulations to those of you, and and you'll know uh, we have some uh, certificates for you, and Robbie will tell you a little bit more about that towards the end of the message. Well, we're in this series, uh, His Name is Jesus, and really what we're talking about are different aspects of, of who Jesus was, you know, and that He was God uh, in the flesh, that He was fully God. Um, we've talked about, or will talk about, His superiority. We'll talk about how He is exclusive, that uh, uh, the Bible says, or Jesus said this Himself, that there is only one name by which you are to come uh, to God, and that's by the name of Jesus uh, himself, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Well, this morning we're going to talk about the humanity of Jesus, the fact that he was um, fully human. You know, we present that idea that he's fully God, but a, a whole lot of people have a hard time believing that he was fully human as well. And just exactly what that means, we're going to look at some of the uh, just the different, you know, aspects of that in his life, uh, his humanity. Um, and, and as early as the second century, there were questions about whether or not Jesus was fully human. Um, people had a hard time fathoming that whole idea. By, by the second century, and, and actually a little bit later than that, there began to even be questions about whether he was fully God. And, and usually what began to take place by some of the early church philosophers or, you know, early philosophers was the fact that some would try to make him more God than he was human or some would try to make him more human than he was God. And in fact, some would even erase his humanity and simply say that he was God and that he came in spirit and, and he kind of, you know, he, he kind of, I, I guess to put it this way, he kind of faked things. And you'll see what I mean as we get into the message itself, um, in the heart of the message, and looking at you know what they said that he faked. You know, uh, you know, just as an example, he faked needing sleep. He faked needing to eat because he was just God in the spirit. Well, the scriptures clearly teach that he was both fully God and fully man. And and in the early church, that's what they 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 absolutely accepted that fact. In fact, the reason that it wasn't a question in, in the, you know, the first couple of, or the first generation at least was because they had seen him. They had seen him in the flesh. They had also witnessed and, 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 and they bore testimony to the things that he did, you know, the, the, the power that he had. Just this past uh, Thursday, we were in a passage of scripture in, in my Bible study, uh, Thursday morning Bible study where we were talking about him having power over the storm, that he just simply spoke to the storm and it stilled the storm. And, and that absolutely, uh, the, the passage in Luke says that that absolutely just astonished the disciples because they knew that the only one who had power over the wind and the waves was God. And, and so they, they, they saw this from him, and so they didn't question it. It wasn't until much later. So now why do we go back and, and, you know, what's the importance of seeing Jesus, his humanity, seeing him as fully human? Well, Blaise Pascal, a philosopher in the 17th century, wrote these words. 
the church has had has much difficulty in showing that Jesus was man against those who denied it, as in showing that he was God, and the probabilities were equally great. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said you should point to the whole man, Jesus Christ, and say that is God, the man, Jesus Christ, is God. And St. Anath- uh, 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 Th- oh yeah, Athanasius, that's it. And St. Athanasius, who was Bishop of Alexandria in the 4th century, wrote, He, meaning Jesus, became what we are, that he might make us what he is. So Jesus is God. Is Jesus man? Yes. Is he God? Yes. You say, why is this important to maintain? And there are two basic ways to error in the identity of Jesus. If you remember from last week, I made the statement that the quickest way to know whether someone is false in their belief system, if they are, um, if they are false, uh, a false religion, is to ask, what do you do with Jesus? And this is a part of it. There are two basic ways to err in the identity of Jesus. One is to say he's God, but he's not really a man. The other is to say he's a good man, but he's not really God. And so the first is where we say Jesus is a good man, but he's not really the eternal one true only real God he's just a really great guy and, and then John 1 14, exactly the example that we're looking at this morning the word that is Jesus became flesh and that's exactly what the incarnation means if you turn to John 4 first John 4 21 sorry first John 4 21 this is what his friend the beloved disciple um, wrote about Jesus. It's actually 1 John 4, 2. I said 21. 1 John 4, 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world and and so essentially John says only Christians only Christians accept that Jesus Christ is God who came into human history as a human being with flesh and blood and bone as a real person to live on this earth Now, about all that we know about Jesus and his humanity, if you will, as he was growing up, is just a short phrase in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, um, Luke writes there and says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, even that statement itself, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this, But even that statement itself proclaims that he is God and he is fully human. He grows in his wisdom, he grows in his stature, and he grows in favor with God and with men. And so this morning we'll spend the the remainder of our time just simply pointing at some of the, the ways that Jesus was indeed fully human. Uh, that he was a man, just like we are men and women. That he physically had flesh and blood. And, and so the very first uh, experience that I want you to see is that Jesus experienced hardships in this life. And so if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3. This is a, an early prophecy about, about Jesus. And, and I think it demonstrates just a little bit about the hardships that, that he faced in this life. Um, in, in verse 2, Isaiah 53, Isaiah writes, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I believe it's in the King James Bible in which 
the, the verse actually reads, he grew up as a shoot of Jesse. And, and what's that, what that is a reference to is that David was promised that he would be given a kingdom that would be eternal, that it would never, ever end. And, and so speaking about Jesus, he says he grew up as a shoot of Jesse, an, an offshoot of Jesse. And, and, and then the next phrase is the root out of dry ground. Um, I couldn't help but think of my, my early childhood in, in, in southern Illinois and, and growing up in the country and being in the woods all the time. I mean, I, I thought of, you know, just this, this verse, or, or that may, this verse made me think of that. Simply because my brother and I spent a lot of time from early age playing in the dirt. I don't know if anybody else ever did that, but we played in the dirt. And so I can remember having some, uh, you know, some of the old Tonka trucks, the actual metal ones, not the plastic ones, but the metal ones. And, and we would have bulldozers and we would be digging in the dirt and you'd run into roots, you know, especially in our, one of our favorite areas. As we got a little bit older, we still played in the dirt, only it was horseshoes. And I remember under this big oak tree, we would go out and we would put those, uh, those stakes in and, and we would pitch horseshoes and pretty soon you, you, you get a pretty good pit. That is, if you're throwing close to the stake, you get a pretty good pit. And, and so, you know, countless times that as we would, you know, make these pits, there would be roots that would come up with them. And so I thought of that root and dry ground. And, and actually, it's a reference to how difficult Jesus' life is going to be. That he, he, he's, not, he's not privileged in his birth. We've already talked about that a little bit in this series. That he was born in very humble beginnings. That his father was, a, his earthly father was a carpenter. That, you know, he had to make a living. And so this, this reference is that Jesus was going to have somewhat of a difficult time. You know, the money that they were given, by the way, uh, the money that they were given by, you know, the wise men who came to worship was probably used up in their trip to Egypt and their trip back in order to protect Jesus. Can I say also that that should be somewhat of, of uh, an indicator that Jesus' life, he faced hardships. Not many of us have to run for our lives. Jesus did. And so he faces, you know, countless and, and endless hardships throughout. Even the fact that he humbled himself in order to come and to serve us. That's what he says that he does. That he humbled himself and he took the form of a servant. That he humbled himself and he took on flesh. You know, Jesus faced the hardships and the difficulties of this life. He, he, he went on to, to tell some who would follow him, you know, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. And he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He faced hardships throughout this life. He was hated by other individuals. This is after he entered into the ministry. He was hated. He experienced hatred on a human level. He had to be careful where he went. At one time he preached in a church in Nazareth, his home church, and they took him out and they, they were going to throw him off of this, this cliff. And so he faced some of the same kind of treatment that, that you and I face. Now, so far I've not been pushed towards a precipice or a cliff. So far. Um, but, but he faced those, those kinds of difficulties that you and I face. Uh, Isaiah goes on and describes, he says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And in, in other words, there was nothing about Jesus that was going to point out the fact that he was who he said that he was, except for his actions. Just like me, just like me and you. The only thing that, see, a lot of people get the picture that Jesus walked around, he had this halo around his head, and everybody that saw him recognized who he was, and that's not true. The scriptures indicate, just like, just like about David, you remember when, when, when Jesse forgets about David, and Samuel says, do you have any other sons? And he says, just the one that's out watching the sheep, and he comes up, 
And, and Samuel says this, surely this could not be the king. Surely this isn't the king. And God spoke and said, Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks upon the heart. And so when Jesus comes to us in his humanity, he does so not as someone who is privileged. Again, I couldn't help. I, I love old rock music. And so I couldn't help of the song Fortunate One or Fortunate Son. If you guys remember that. CCR, that's right. Creedence Clearwater Revival. Thank you. But I couldn't help but think, you know, some folks are born, you know, wet, made to wave the flag, ooh, the red, white, and blue. And you remember that? It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't, I ain't no senator's son. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no fortunate one. And it was, a, it was actually, a, you know, a, in response to the Vietnam War and, and how all of the poor boys in our nation were being sent to fight that war while all of the privileged young men and young women were being, you know, protected in some ways. Well, that's kind of what God says or what Isaiah says about Jesus. There's nothing special about his appearance. He's not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's not born a child of privilege, but rather he is born a child who will face the hardships of life. Do you know that Jesus, we, we really believe that Jesus lost his dad at a fairly early age, his earthly dad. And so Jesus had that responsibility of stepping into the role to help take care of his brothers and sisters, help take care of his mother. We know that because when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looks down and in that moment, he, another moment of humanity in which he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on my best friend, John, to take responsibility for my mother. And so he says, woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. Jesus demonstrates his humanity in the fact that he faced the hardships of life, the difficulties, and, and he shares those experiences with, with each one of us. But secondly, Jesus experienced temptations. In Matthew chapter 4, in Matthew chapter 4, we get the, the, you know, the, the first taste of that. Now, I, I'm intentional in saying it that way, that it's the first taste of his temptations. M many, many people, I, I think they read these temptations and they think, okay, that's it. Jesus was tempted right here and that's it. I want you to understand that these temptations, these same temptations go on for a lifetime with him. The, the very first temptation, of course, he's hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, and, and Satan knows that he's hungry. And while he's hungry, Satan comes to him and says, Hey, since you're the Son of God, now he puts it in the form of this question, if you are the Son of God, but it really should be translated, since you are the Son of God, make these stones turn to bread. And so Jesus answers him with these words. He said, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you ever think that throughout Jesus' life that he was tempted at times to, to use the scriptures to his benefit? See, this is where it gets tricky. A lot of people want to say, no, I don't think that. He was tempted in every way that we are. And so as a preacher... Or your Sunday school teachers, you need to understand that there are times. Or even as a parent, parents, even as a parent or a grandparent, sometimes we are tempted to twist the scriptures to our benefit just a little bit. Or even to misquote things. One of my favorite shows whenever I was growing up was All in the Family. I know, it's a bad show. But I used to like to watch All in the Family. And, and Archie Bunker was a master of argument. Even to the point that he would misquote the Bible in order to win his argument. You ever know anybody like that? I have. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we were, and yet he did not sin. Now here's, 
here's the deal. Please, please understand this. I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to put things into Jesus' life. I just want you to understand that right here he's tempted. Satan comes and says, you know, use, use your power to your benefit. And he responds like I believe he responded every time. Absolutely every time. Let's look at what the scripture says. And then let's do what the scripture says. That, that's what I believe about Jesus. So please don't, don't hear me as trying to say that. Because here's, here's the balance. He was fully man. And he was fully God. By the way, do I ever believe that Jesus was tempted to lust? Absolutely, because the scriptures say that he was tempted in every way that you and I are. However, he did not sin. Why? Because he is fully God. Okay, are you following me? But we cannot make the statements that Jesus just, just, just was above all these things because he wasn't. By the way, let me say this here. He loses a few things. When Jesus becomes, you know, the incarnate son of God, when he comes to earth, he loses a few things. Not only, it's not that he loses them. The book of Philippians says that he gives them up. See, all of a sudden, Jesus can't be everywhere at once. You do understand that, right? That doesn't mean that he doesn't have the power to do something, to heal someone in another city because we see that he does. But he can't physically be everywhere at once. He loses his omnipresence. His, 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 his uh, being present everywhere is gone because he is in this physical body. He is in the shell. He is limited in that, in that way. He, he, he loses you know, some of those benefits. In fact, the scriptures say he gave them up in order to come to be with us and to walk with us. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm taking you with this. Putting on our flesh means that he has to experience some things that the, that, the, that the Son of God, that God should never have to experience, and yet he did. And so was he tempted in all of these ways? Absolutely. Let's go on to the next temptation. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written... He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Anybody remember another incident, at least one incident, where someone says to him, throw yourself down, bring yourself down? At the cross. At the cross. In, in the hour probably of his greatest hu humanity, his suffering in human form, dying upon the cross, someone, a guard, person in the crowd, the thief next to him, they say to him, if you're who you say you are, then, t then save yourself. Take yourself down and bring us down too. You know, constantly he is tempted. The final temptation Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I think of the countless times when it says that Jesus removed himself from the crowds, that this was the very temptation that he was facing. He would remove himself from the crowds because he knew that they were about to take him by force. He would remove himself from the crowds because perhaps he knew that he was being tempted in human form. He was being tempted with the fact to take them as his army. You know, we, we have to look at it in that sense in that he was fully human and yet he was fully God. I'm not even suggesting that he ever had the desire to do that. It's that the temptation was present. Because Jesus experienced temptation just as you and I experience it. Jesus, thirdly, I believe, experienced the joys of life. Now, there's some real purists, you know, in the church who, who want to take this and say, oh, no, Jesus never, ever experienced joys. Well, listen, I don't think Jesus... I like some of the old movies that, that are about Jesus because 
Sometimes he is, you know, um, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's so solemn. And I don't see that in Jesus at all, although a lot of people have. You know, in fact, G.K. Chesterton, for example, uh, author of a book called Orthodoxy, the last line of the book, this is what he says about Jesus. The one thing that Jesus hid from us was his, was his mirth, meaning his sense of humor, that Jesus hid that. I, I don't think that at all about Jesus. Um, you know, Frederick, Fe, Frederick Nietzsche once or thought the same thing. He was an atheist philosopher, and listen what he says. It's too bad Jesus didn't learn how to laugh. In fact, that's one of the reasons that he rejected Jesus, because he thought Jesus was too boring, that he was too solemn. Can I give you a couple of examples of where I think Jesus really used his sense of humor? I think of when he's speaking to his disciples and he's saying, listen, it's easier to take a camel through the needle of to the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And of course, what people have come out and, and tried to say is that the eye of the needle was a gate there in Jerusalem. As far as we know, that that's not true. I, I have to say that I've even preached it that way before, but it's not true. Jesus was simply saying, it's easier to take a camel through the eye of a needle. Now, obviously, you don't get it. But he's using humor. Uh, you could call it sarcasm if you want. And I guess, you know, I, I particularly don't like sarcasm when someone's speaking to me. I am a very sarcastic person. You know, that's, that's how it goes, isn't it? We don't like sarcasm unless we're the ones using it. And, and so it may have been a sarca sarcastic statement. And you may not like that, but that's okay because Jesus is God. And if he wants to be sarcastic, then he will be sarcastic. And so what he says is it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. I think he was using sarcastic humor in that case. I think when he's telling the story about helping a brother get the speck out of the eye, that, you know, have you ever tried to envision someone who has a two before coming out of their head? I think he's using humor. In fact, uh, this, the, the, the video series, Matthew, um, that's exactly what he does. He says, why are you so concerned with the speck, the splinter that is in your brother's eye? And he picks up this huge beam and he puts it to the side of his head and he says, when you have a beam coming out of your own. I think he was using humor. I think he was using humor with the disciples, those fishermen, whenever he said... Put your net out on the other side. You know they had to laugh. They laughed. We, we were in, in on the Sea of Galilee, by the way. And we're there on the Sea of Galilee. And we've got this fellow that's uh, sailing the boat for us. And he's going to show us what a cast net looks like. And so he casts this net out. He pulls it up and it's empty. And, and, and there were 20 preachers on the ship Guess what all 20 of us said at once? Throw it on the other side. He goes, you don't think I've heard that joke before? <laughs> so Jesus was constantly, I believe, using his sense of humor as well. Jesus also experienced physical needs. Um, this is perhaps one of the greatest indicators uh, that he was indeed um, fully human. He experienced physical needs um, throughout the, the scriptures. We are told that he needed to rest. Not only did he withdraw from the crowds because of the threat that they were going to take him by force and make him king, but he also withdrew from them and told his disciples to withdraw as well so that they might rest. Let's take the boat to the other side so that we might rest. Jesus needed rest. We know even in that trip that... It, on one of the trips in Luke uh, chapter 8, uh, that he was asleep in the bow of the boat whenever the storm came upon them. 
uh, he, he, he had needs, physical needs. He needed to, to, to rest. He needed to sleep. He would grow hungry. We know that from Matthew chapter 4. It says that he was very hungry and Satan came to him. There are other times throughout Scripture. You know, uh, it's not just that he notices that the crowd needs to be fed, but probably at that time Jesus was a little hungry himself. Um, I think of uh, him growing thirsty. The, the two that strike me the most is the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, when he goes to visit with her and he asks her to give him a drink. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus got thirsty. And then, of course, the other time is upon the cross when he cried out to the crowd, or not just to the crowd, but to to anyone that I thirst. And even then when he kind of got a little taste of the brine that they had given him, which was, you know, had been doctored up a little bit that it might help with pain, he refused that. But he got thirsty. He had all the same physical needs that, that you and I have. And then finally, of all the experiences that, that God had, of all the experiences that he had to face on our behalf, you know, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort in knowing that, that anything that I've ever been tempted with, Jesus was tempted with. You know, I, I take great comfort with that. I, I don't know that, let me illustrate it in this way, I guess. Um, Years ago, I was really struggling in, in Salem. Jennifer and I were part of a, a little ministry there. And one of, the, one of the guys that I had played football with, his dad, they were both called, their names were Emmett Shoemaker. And we called him Big Emmett and Little Emmett. I know, only in southern Illinois. Big Emmett and Little Emmett. And so one day I was visiting with Big Emmett. Little Emmett had come to visit our church. He'd been in the Marine Corps and... and uh, after a while, he uh, had come back home, and he was married and trying to run a business, and so he had come to our church, and I was a little excited about that because most people who knew me before I became a Christian um, really didn't come to our church. Um, you've heard me say that before, that, you know, they, they just, they, I don't know, they weren't open to the change that, that had taken place, you know. Know that your preacher has experienced that along with you. Because I know it's true of each one of you as well. That sometimes those, those friends and family that when you d decide to follow Jesus. That you know, they don't always like the changes that take place. But, but what e Emmett told me was this. He said, you know, I can listen to you. Not little Emmett, but big Emmett. Big Emmett said, I can have a lot of respect for you too because... I remember what you used to be. And to be quite honest with you, I would rather listen to someone who's come through it than I would listen to someone who has never experienced anything like that in their life. And that, that struck me because that's exactly what I want you to understand that the Bible says about Jesus. We can trust him. We can follow him because he's, he's gone through everything that you and I have faced. And yet he's come out triumphant. But of all those things, all those things that he's faced in his humanity, the one thing that God should never have faced was death. The God who is eternal has come to die. And that, according to Paul, not only death, but death on a cross. See, Jesus in his humanity upon that cross was not simply experiencing pain unlike any other pain, agony unlike any other agony because of his beating, because of the, 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 the chunks of flesh that had been ripped out of him, because of you know suffocating upon the cross, because of the, the nails being placed in his feet, in his hands, or his wrist, whichever you prefer. But they're placed in just the right spot to bring about the most agony. 
And it's not just that in his human form that he is suffering, but it's when when he takes my sin and, and when God takes your sin, that, that sin that separates you, that, that sin that damns you, and, and all of a sudden he takes that and he places it upon Jesus, there is need for a human sacrifice. And God didn't require it of you. And he didn't require it of me, but he placed it upon his son. In that moment, Jesus is most human. Because in that moment, what he, what he had never, ever had placed upon his shoulders was placed upon his shoulders in our sin. And it's in that time of his greatest suffering and it's in that time when God turns his face from him and it's in that time that the God of the universe he dies Hebrews Hebrews chapter 4 will echo that fact that I, that I just brought up that we have a we have a priest who can identify with all that we've been through but the writer of Hebrews issues a challenge at the end of the statement that he makes we'll begin in verse 14 the writer of Hebrews says therefore since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And then he says, because of this, let us then, because of this, Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In just a minute, we're going to play a video for our invitation. I know that's a little different, but you'll see why we're using uh, the words to this song. I want you to watch the video as well. Because it's all about life. It's all about our life, yours and mine. And it's even about the life that Jesus came and he lived. One in which he was tempted in every way as you and I are, but one in which he never, ever failed. He never sinned. And our sins were placed upon him. And he now has risen from the dead. He is back in his rightful place in heaven. And he reigns there. And he offers, in in the words of Hebrews, he offers an opportunity for us to boldly approach the throne of God and to receive his grace. That is, listen, listen. That is... If you don't let the time slip by. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front. You always hear us say, the invitation is always open and it is. It's always open. God can add to his church on a daily basis, not just on Sunday morning. But I want you to play, pay close attention to the words that you're about to hear. Because every moment that you allow to pass from receiving and and answering the call of Jesus Christ upon your life to come and to share in his grace, every moment is time that slipped away. It slips away. And at one time, you'll come to the end of your life and, and it's all gone. And none of us know None of us know when that will happen and when that will take place. 
while it's still called today, God says to make things right. To make them right with Him and to make them right with each other. And to make them right within our families. started talking he took me back in time he said i was young and thought i'd always be then i woke up now i'm 83 there's so much i missed oh how i wish i could get back all that time i wasted i see the tears of a young bride the morning that we My mama died I hung up the phone And never said goodbye Don't let it slip on Don't let it slip on Don't let it slip on by Well he looked up Tears in his eyes Said I'm not sure If you were looking for advice There's just something about you That reminds me of me Always looking back But it seems these days That it's all I have What hurts me the most Is knowing what could have been And if I listen real close Sometimes I can 